<clears throat> All right, the final part of this lecture is going to cover identity by descent and kind of how that is used in order to infer um, ancestry, um, recent ancestors, and also is useful for identifying um, ancient introgressions um, between different hominids. And so this is just kind of a straightforward application of chapter five's work on linkage. And here I'm showing you a pedigree. And so we are showing you a pedigree that results in a brother and a sister um, along with cousins uh, within this family uh, tree. And so these individuals that make up the first generation are all, uh, are all unrelated. And so we have created 10 unique colored chromosomes to indicate that all of these chromosomes are unique. And so when we talked about linkage and when we talked about recombination, we showed that offsprings would uh, have chimeric combinations um, of the two chromosomes. And so we're de designating this here. So this individual, for example, provides a gamete, and this gamete happens to be a chimeric um, cross with the first quarter of the chromosome from the blue and the three quarters, the next three quarters from the orange. And similarly, this is approximately half-half. So this is important to, to note because this is a way to, to show the relationship between two related individuals. So this brother and sister are related to each other and because they're not unique individuals, we can no longer color code these so that they have four unique colors. Um, and that's because we can actually recognize these alleles are no longer uniquely linked together, but they actually have a specific pattern that is generated within this chromosome. And so when we compare, for example, you know, to create something like this, um, this brother relationship right here, kind of what we're doing is we're looking for regions that are what, what are called identical by descent. And so this region right here is basically the same in both the brother and the sister. And so it's called identical by descent because they've, they've inherited identical copies of this part of the chromosome because it descended from the, from the same individual. Um, so this and this would not be identical by descent because the blue and the orange are independent chromosomes. Same with here, this orange part and this blue part would not be identical by descent. It's only the chromosomes that are, that are inherited the same from the father or the mother. And so for the second copy right here, while it was possible to have identical by descent, that did not happen because they just happened to inherit the, the opposite, um, actually probably this region right here, this small region right here, um, where they both have the light blue, that would also be identical by descent. And so, this region right here would be dark purple. These regions right here and here would be light purple. And then the regions outside would be uh, gray. And so this is basically how you would create something like this is that um, you would use those alleles to find regions that are, that are in linkage and then you infer whether or not they're identical at both chromosomes, one chromosome or neither chromosome. And then when we look further on um, to this relationship between cousins, and so you know this would produce a new chimeric chromosome right here. So this individual produced this one right here, this individual produced this one right here, and then the same thing right here. You can see there still is a short region of the chromosome that is identical to each other. And so these cousins would also have um, part of their DNA be identical by descent. And so we'll have an activity that kind of explores this more, but that is the idea behind this analysis in 23andMe, is that they, they look for, you know, if we go all the way back to one of these first slides, um, right here, basically you're looking for runs in different individuals where they have all of the same alleles. So, you know, in my brother, we both have this run of GTAGA, um, and that indicates that we have the same chromosome here. 
So that is the procedure by which you use linkage in order to infer ancestry and different levels of ancestry have a different expected amount of DNA that you share. Um, and of course there's always probability that's associated with it and so that's why these relationships are second to third. They're not precise relationships because stochasticness you know, becomes important and um, you know, eventually you can't use statistics to distinguish whether or not this is a second cousin or a third cousin. Mm -hmm. um, this is also important for inbreeding. Um, so inbreeding is another way that individuals can violate Hardy-Weinberg. Um, so Hardy-Weinberg, one of the assumptions is that mating is random, um, but inbreeding indicates that you're more likely to ha have offspring with a member of your own family. And so this was, this was common in the Habsburgs, for example, which was a ruling family um, in the, actually I should know my, in Austria and the Holy Roman Empire, um, where oftentimes uh, cousins, second cousins, or uncles and nieces would marry each other. And so this ended up having negative consequences where these individuals have, having you know, developmental disorders uh, and characteristic, uh, 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 very characteristic features that were not common in the population. So the Habsburgs, for example, were famous for their large noses and their large chins. Um, and inbreeding can have very negative consequences um, because it's much more likely that you have certain genetic diseases. And so the reason for that is that when, you know, if these two individuals um, have a child together, it is possible that this child inherits uh, the exact same piece of chromosome from both parents. So they could, this, this individual could become homozygous for a large part of the chromosome. And so these large swaths are much more likely to contain some sort of recessive allele that's very detrimental. But this recessive allele typically is never homozygous because it's a very rare allele in the population. You know, so you can have some alleles that are, are very, very rare, you know, one in a million, let's say. Um, and so the chance of an individual, you know, matching someone that has this exact same um, allele is, you know, one in a million. So it's a very rare thing to happen. Uh, but this no longer, in these inbreeding cases, this no longer becomes such a rare thing because now you can match these together. Uh, you're much more likely to match these together because of this identity by descent. Um, so identity by descent is not only important for figuring out these familiar relationships, but it also is important for understanding inbreeding and kind of the effects that it has um, on, on phenotypes. Um, uh, then finally, IBD has been very useful to infer ancestral inbreeding with non-modern humans. Um, and so, you know, this is possible because um, we have samples, bone samples um, of hominids uh, that were preserved to a level that um, DNA was preserved. So we have these bone samples like shin bones, finger bones from Neanderthals and Denisovans, um, which are two ancient hominids that preceded um, current modern humans. And so we know the DNA sequence of these. And so we can look in current humans to see if any of these linkage, any of these you know, alleles are linked together in such a way that you, know, you see them in Neanderthals, uh, but they're not common in humans. And so that was actually able to, to determine that um, modern humans after they left Africa must have had some sort of inbreeding with Neanderthal populations as well as Denisovan population. And then this is also specific to, to certain populations. So for example, there's not evidence for Neanderthal DNA in African populations, um, but there is evidence for Neanderthal DNA in, um, in French, Han, and, and Mel Melanesian, I'm not even sure how to say that, um, populations. And then the Denisovans also have this evidence of Denisovan DNA uh, in this current population as well. And so, you know, we now have a much better understanding of what happened. So around 60 to 70,000 years ago, some ancestors um, left Africa in order to migrate to Europe um, as well as Asia. And so 
after they left Africa, they encountered Neanderthals. So Neanderthals and Denisovans had left Africa, you know, a much longer period of time ago. And so we had these stable populations of Neanderthals that were living in these areas. And so as they migrated, they actually mated with Neanderthals and had offspring. Um, and so they were able to capture some of the Neanderthal DNA. After the population that eventually went to uh, migrate to Asia, this population mated with Denisovans, which is another ancestral hominid, um, and captured some of the Denisovan DNA. Um, so 350,000 years ago, these populations had left Africa and migrated throughout Eurasia. So why do we see these signatures of, of um, Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA? It's thought that these pieces of DNA, so this is still you know, a very, very um, uh, modern source of research, a modern, a modern problem in research, but one of the big problems is to understand why this Neanderthal DNA, for example, is, is present throughout these populations. Um, so one possibility is simply, is simply uh, migration um, and genetic drift, but another possibility is that these alleles that, that are, were retained are actually under positive selection. And there actually is some evidence that these the, that some of these alleles actually were under selection. So one of these we already covered, um, and so that was actually this EPOS1 haplotype, and this haplotype actually comes from Denisovans. And so the idea is that the Denisovans had left hundreds of thousands of years ago. They were found in Tibet in these kind of high mountainous populations, or per, you know, were found in, in high 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 altitudes where the oxygen level was low and they had already adapted um, by having this haplotype of EPOS1 um, that made them better able to live at these high altitudes. And so the modern humans mated with Denisovans and were able to actually, to, to actually incorporate that haplotype into the modern human DNA and then because of selection and the advantage that this haplotype gave the modern humans, um, this, this was actually able to spread in modern humans um, in these specific populations that were living at high, high altitudes. Um, and a similar kind of cool story just came out recently in response to COVID. Uh, so um, GWAS is a way to identify regions of the genome that are associated with a phenotype. And so one of the things that they did very early on in 2020 is to actually look for genetic variation that affects the severity of your um, response to COVID. So patients that were much more likely to need to be hospitali hospitalized with COVID versus patients that did not need to be hospitalized. And so you kind of age match and kind of risk factor match, and then you just look for genetic differences that might, might influence that. And so you can see there's this really strong peak. And so there's something on chromosome three that's affecting COVID severity, the severity of COVID. And very interestingly, this um, is this haplotype is actually associated with Neanderthal DNA. So, so this risk factor actually comes from Neanderthal. So, this is not to say that um, this is not to say that that COVID nineteen has been spreading and has been around since the time of the Neanderthals, but rather potentially this haplotype influences susceptibility to other viruses. So you, there's a large number of coronaviruses that, that exist. Um, and so potentially this region was associated with resistance or susceptibility to, to these other coronaviruses. And then this genetic variation actually had an effect um, on the COVID-19 as well. Um, and if you look at kind of the, the propensity of this allele, the, the frequency of this allele in different populations, you can see that it is primarily found um, in, in India, Pakistan kind of regions, um, as well as some other regions uh, as well. And so, you know, this could either have been advantageous in this region um, because it conferred some sort of resistance to coronavirus that was specific to these regions, um, or it could have been selected against kind of in these other places because it, uh, provided susceptibility um, to coronaviruses and kind of was, was swept away. Um, so, you know, a lot of times with these evolutionary stories, you don't really know the answer, the reason why. But it's just kind of a cool, cool 
feature of, of research these days where we're actually starting to figure out um, and identify hominid, ancient hominid DNA, and now we can start to tease apart and understand their effects in modern humans. So that is the extent of the lecture on population genetics, and um, you know, just I hopefully, hopefully this and, and this actually comes to end the, the the whole section of the class on genetic analysis. But hopefully, you can see how this has, has all these chapters have kind of tied together and kind of culminated in this into this understanding of of kind of really practical genetics and personal genetics um, that that is really a forefront of research um, right now.